The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. We're going to start the webinar. I'd like to welcome you all to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's presentation of Living with Cardiomyopathy, Exercise and Sports Guidelines. My name is Cindy Andrake, and I am the Family Support Manager here at the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. Uh, we're really glad that you can join us today, but before I introduce you to our presenter, I do have a few housekeeping reminders that I want to go over before the webinar. Um, if at any time during the presentation you have technical issues, please type your concerns in the question box on your control panel, and we will do our best to address them. If you have any audio issues or difficulty hearing, you should be able to switch from your computer screen to a call-in phone number to correct the audio. In order to provide the highest quality webinar session and to avoid any background noise, um, all of the attendees today will be in the listen-only mode during this presentation. Uh, we do encourage you to ask questions, um, and we are going to reserve the last 15 to 20 minutes of the presentation um, uh, to uh, ask, answer your questions. So submit any general questions about pediatrics or pediatrics. Pediatric Cardiomyopathy um, Exercise and Sports Guidelines into the question box, which is located on the control panel. Um, and I will read them at the end of the presentation. If the control panel is preventing you from seeing the screen during the presentation, you can hide it by clicking the small orange arrow at the top left of the control panel. Uh, Dr. Burstein has graciously provided copies of her slides from today's presentation, so if you want a copy, um, just uh, put a note to me in the question box and I will make sure that you get copies of the slide. Uh, last, we are recording today's webinar presentation and we are going to post it on our YouTube channel, which is called CCF Heart Kids, that's all one word. Um, so if anybody wants to access the recording later, you could just go to our YouTube channel. So with all of the housekeeping reminders complete, it's my true pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, Dr. Danielle Bernstein. She is an assistant professor of pediatrics and a pediatric cardiologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Bernstein completed her pediatric training at Stanford Children's Hospital, followed by fellowships in pediatric cardiology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She cares for children with cardiomyopathy and heart failure with an emphasis on exercise training in these populations. She is actively involved in developing exercise recommendations for children with cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and congenital heart disease. Dr. Burstein was recognized as, an, as the Ann Newman Fellow of the Year for Outstanding Teaching in the Pediatric Cardiology Fellowship Program. I really want to thank Dr. Bernstein for being with us today. We're absolutely thrilled that she could join us. So at this point, I am going to turn uh, the presentation over to Dr. Bernstein and I am going to um, share the, um, I'm going to change the screen so that she will, you can see her screen. All right. Does this show properly for everyone? I can see it. I can right, see great. it. So thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy uh, day, busy schedule to join this webinar. Um, this is a topic that uh, is very exciting to me and I'm sure near to dear, near and dear to you as well. Um, and thank you to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation for providing this opportunity for us to get to talk about this important topic. So my goals today um, are to review the importance of exercise, review levels of activity, and then go over some risk associated with activities in cardiomyopathy. Um, I'm hoping that I'll address questions that come up, um, come across your minds, but also have come from questions when I've cared for patients so far. So I think it's important to recognize that some degree of exercise is good for everyone, including patients with cardiomyopathy. There's numerous benefits of physical activity, both with skeletal muscle training and strengthening. It decreases the risk for acquired heart disease, including developing high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and having early heart attacks in adulthood. 
And additionally, there's numerous psychological uh, benefits from exercise, including improving self-confidence, higher self-esteem, um, improved exercise or school performance and um, other benefits. So we want to try to figure out ways to incorporate physical activity into all children's care, regardless of their diagnosis. To remind you, the American Heart Association recommends at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous, in, vigorous intensity aerobic activity every day for children. Um, and so it's important when trying to think about how can we safely incorporate these recommendations into children that have cardiomyopathy, which I know can be uh, a confusing and challenging task to try to navigate. When I go through the discussion of physical activity, this is a general rule of thumb that you can use or um, when you're talking to your children about what types of physical activity to do. So when we're talking about low intensity activity, this is activity where if you're performing it, you can simultaneously easily sing a song. That means you're not dysmic or out of breath enough from your exertion to prevent you from being able to sing a full song. Moderate intensity activity um, will limit you by not being able to sing, but you can talk in full sentences. And then a high intensity activity is where you're unable to talk in full sentences due to your breathlessness related to the physical activity you're participating in. Although there are more standardized uh, classifications of physical activity, I feel like these general rule of thumb and these categories are helpful when trying to think about how can you guide your child um, towards what type of activities to participate in. Additionally, when we talk about levels of activity, there are other terms that also do come up. So when we speak about physical activity, this refers to any active body movement resulting from muscle contraction that increases your metabolic rate sixfold. Recreational sports are activities that you participate in, but without pressure to play or continue playing for longer or at a higher intensity than you're desired. Competitive sport is defined as activities with the pressure to train at a high intensity, regardless of whether you, it's self-desired or self-directed. So when thinking about this, competitive sports are sports where you're being pushed against uh, beyond your own level of exertion or your own level of where you would uh, stop and take a break versus recreational sports are allowing children to self-pace or people to self-pace their activity without being pressured uh, to perform beyond that level. And this is, these are examples when we're thinking about recreational sports, walking, jogging at your own leisure, dancing, recreational bike, bicycling, are all examples of recreational activity. However, competitive sports where you're being asked to push beyond your own limits. In our community, CrossFit or those sorts of activities, playing on sports teams where you have a coach that's really pushing you against your, or beyond what you would normally limit your activity at are examples of competitive sports. And when you're speaking to your provider, uh, this is an example of guidelines for what types of physical activity exist. And this becomes important when we're thinking about what types of activities to recommend based on your uh, degree of cardiomyopathy. So you don't need to memorize this by any stretch, but it's just so that you know it exists. Um, so these activities are categorized Along the x-axis or bottom axis, you can see increasing dynamic component to sports or that you're increasing need for endurance. While along the y-axis, there's uh, increasing need for static component or increasing need for strength. And different sports have been categorized into various boxes because when we're thinking about different types of activity, we'll say what type of activity or which categories they fall into.
However, it's important to recognize that guidelines are written by experts in the field. Um, they are based on collective available information from published studies on the topics. Um, but guidelines are really uh, based on facts and expert opinions. Um, so they are not, and in the field of pediatrics, they're not always based on the most recent uh, data that's out there. Sometimes there's some lag, and additionally, sometimes the amount of data that's out there is not quite as robust as we would hope for. So an example of that is um, randomized control clinical trials, which are when patients are uh, placed into two groups, whether participating in a sport or not, um, that would provide the best data for trying to figure out what's safest, but there's often obstacles in pediatrics for performing those types of studies. So for the purposes of the recommendations we're gonna go over today, when we're talking about competitive sports participation, they're really based on the US guidelines, um, both from 2005, as well as they were updated in 2015. And there's additionally European guidelines from 2005. And in general, these recommendations so far have recommended that all individuals with cardiomyopathy be excluded from participating in most competitive sports. The one caveat to that is that the guidelines for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and exercise participation are actually in the process of being revised um, and specific areas are regarding the exercise participation. So these new guidelines are due to come out uh, about a year from now and may actually uh, influence what we're recommending to our patients. But until that time, the current guidelines, uh, most recently updated in 2015, are what I will discuss today. One question that comes up is whether there are differences in exercise restrictions in children versus adults that have cardiomyopathy. And to date, there's not. So the exercise recommendations are the same, whether you're a child or an adult with cardiomyopathy. However, as I said, uh, just stated, there are evolving uh, evidence and guidelines being developed and pediatric specific guidelines um, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are the uh, area of great focus right now. And so it'll be uh, very interesting for you to talk to your provider over the next year once they're published to see whether that changes recommendations um, for this topic. So when we think about activity restrictions, uh, there are different recommendations based on what type of cardiomyopathy you have, um, specifically a dilated cardiomyopathy versus a left ventricular non-compaction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or restrictive cardiomyopathy. And so that's why um, not all patients receive the same exercise restrictions or exercise recommendations. It's very much individualized based on your type of cardiomyopathy. And I'll go over that a little more in the subsequent slides. There's one other entity that I want to bring up because uh, some of you might have heard about it, and this is called athlete's heart. Um, so specifically, when we talk about this entity of athlete's heart, it often has some overlap with cardiomyopathy, but actually is a distinct entity um, that is not considered pathologic. So there are, there are changes that happen to the heart with different types of sports training. So with activities that involve more endurance, such as swimming or running, the changes that happen include having an increased volume of the ventricle. So the ventricle gets bigger so that each time it contracts, it pumps more blood to the body. It does not usually change the thickness of the wall, but can make the ventricle larger. 
And with that, sometimes the function, because it can pump more blood with each beat, each squeeze might not be quite as strong because it doesn't need to pump quite as much, uh, or quite as forcefully to pump the same amount of blood to the body. I raise this issue because this can result in a heart that may appear similar to a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, but there are specific uh, features that we look at to try to differentiate a patient that has an athlete's heart or changes to their heart due to athletic training versus a true cardiomyopathy. Conversely, uh, Athletic training that involves significant strength training, including weightlifting and wrestling, has different effects on the heart. It can conversely increase the wall thickness, but not necessarily change the volume of the heart. And usually the squeeze of the heart is normal. Um, so when we're seeing patients that are highly athletic and have some changes, Sometimes it's difficult to be able to differentiate between true cardiomyopathy and uh, athlete's heart. And so one recommendation will be to stop participating in the exercise for about three to six months to see if the heart normalizes, which would confirm that this is an athlete's heart instead of a true cardiomyopathy. Um, after which point, allowing to resume normal physical activity and normal sports participation is generally recommended. So when speaking, thinking about left ventricular non-compaction and thinking about what sort of activity is appropriate, generally participation in competitive sports is allowed um, according to, as I said, the most recent 2015 guidelines, um, as long as patients are asymptomatic, they have normal ventricular function, they have no history of arrhythmias, and they have no history of passing out. And I've listed here some of the testing that might get performed to be able to evaluate these risk factors. Um, so specifically imaging with echo cardio echocardiography or cardiac uh, MRIs. And then evaluating for arrhythmias, including using Holter monitors for 24 hours or other event monitors, as well as exercise stress tests. All of these are used to make sure that there's not any risk factors for children to participate in competitive sports. And then generally speaking, uh, participation in recreational sports is allowed even if the above are present. When we're thinking about patients with dilated cardiomyopathy or restrictive cardiomyopathy without significant thickness, the same applies as the left ventricular non-compaction. So patients that, have, uh, that are asymptomatic, that have preserved function, no arrhythmias and no history of passing out are also encouraged to participate in competitive sports. Um, and regardless of the above, should be allowed to participate in recreational sports. Um, again, those being sports that you participate in at your own leisure, but are allowed to self-pace um, and not be pushed beyond your ability. When we think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as I stated before, this is an area of ongoing study um, and so I, guidelines are continuing to evolve and what I present today might be different than what is recommended in the next year or two with um, ongoing data that's being analyzed. But at the current state, um, patients that are, have a gene for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but don't have any evidence of disease are allowed to participate in any competitive sports. Um, in order to evaluate for disease, um, you have to fulfill the following criteria. So to not have any symptoms or to be asymptomatic, to have normal uh, ventricular wall thickness and normal ventricular function, again, can be evaluated either by echocardiography or by cardiac MRI. Should not have a history of arrhythmias 
um, as evaluated by exercise stress test or Holter monitors. You should not have any history of unexplained passing out. And you should not have a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy related sudden death. And similarly, participation in recreational sports is allowed. However, at the current point, uh, point today, when talking about competitive sports participation, if you do have evidence of disease, the current 2015 American Heart Association guidelines do not recommend participation in competitive sports. That is the one exception is the low intensity sports. So to remind you, there was the chart that I showed you earlier on. We discussed low intensity sports that's specifically referring to that bottom left box, including these activities, including golf, riflery, and yoga. However, uh, regarding recreational sports participation, that is generally recommended but focusing more so on low to moderate intensity activities. So when we're talking about low intensity recreational sports, that can include activities such as horseback riding, non-free weight weightlifting of low weights, uh, less than 20 pounds, skating, scuba diving, or you can do moderate intensity activities such as cycling, hiking, jogging, doubles tennis, and swimming. And this is based on the 2005 guidelines for recreational sports in uh, children with cardiovascular abnormalities. When we talk to, when I talk to families about general activities to try to avoid in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's some general guidelines that we do try to recommend um, when thinking about what sort of recreational sports to participate in. So the first is the avoidance of burst type activity. Um, or this refers to activities where you go from a standstill to a sprinting and is characterized by rapid acceleration and deceleration over short distances. The, uh, exercise of this type is encountered in a variety of sports such as basket, uh, basketball, particularly full court play, soccer and singles tennis. Therefore, prefer preference is given to recreational sporting activities such as informal jogging without a training regimen, biking on level terrain or lap swimming in which the energy expended is largely stable and consistent even over relatively long distances or for long periods of time. We also recommend uh, trying to avoid extreme heat or cold conditions um, as this may be associated with alterations in blood volume, electrolytes, and states of hydration, um, particularly if the temperatures you know, above 80 to 90 degrees or less than freezing temperature, if there's high humidity, or if you're at substantial altitude. When we're thinking about higher levels of conditioning, again, this is when we've talked about the competitive sports versus recreational sports and trying to avoid pushing children against their own uh, threshold of exertion, particularly if they feel any symptoms associated with that. Um, so exercise programs, um, even if they are considered recreational, that require systemic or progressive levels of exertion and are focused on achieving high levels of conditioning or excellence, such as road running, uh, competitive road running, competitive cycling or rowing, should generally be uh, discouraged. And then lastly, when talking about uh, activities, we generally recommend um, avoiding activities that have an intense static or isometric exertion. So this is a heavier weightlifting um, because when you lift weights and perform that Valsalva maneuver where you hold your breath as you're trying to exert your muscle um, contraction, it can increase the risk for uh, left ventricular outflow tracker obstruction or blockage of blood trying to get from the ventricle to the body. 
And in our practice, we'll generally uh, provide if schools want uh, letters on recommendations for gym participation and such, providing these sorts of recommendations can be helpful so that they can know, have some guidance as to uh, sports participation for children. So historically, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, we know is associated with increased risk for sudden cardiac death. The estimates of this risk uh, range, but previously have been thought to occur between 0.3 and 1% per year. I will say there's more recent data coming out that that level may be lower than that, um, but it is true that having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with increased risk for sudden cardiac death. However, to put this in perspective, um, if you think about this and other numbers, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with risk for sudden cardiac death as in one to three per 100,000 person years. When you think about activities such as concussions and football in children, the rates are actually reported about 5,000 per 100,000 person years, so about 5,000 times higher than the risk of a sudden cardiac event and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So just thinking about what level of risk you're willing to take when you're thinking about sports participation for your children, um, it's helpful to try to put in perspective uh, the numbers that we're talking about. Additionally, historically, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was thought to be the leading cause of sudden cardiac death. Um, but there's actually been a recent study published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they looked at uh, children and young adults, um, and of the 490 cases of sudden cardiac death, it was found that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy actually only comprised 4% of the total number of cases, with the most cases occurring in normal hearts, um, followed by other diseases as shown here. So overall, it's now thought that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may account for anywhere from three to 10% of all sudden cardiac death, but is not the most common cause of sudden cardiac death. And then when thinking about how vigorous activity contributes to risk for sudden cardiac death, although we acknowledge that there is increased risk of having these events with having this disease, the data regarding vigorous physical exertion um, and how it contributes to increased risk for sudden cardiac death is not quite as clear. The, the previous thought is that high intensity competitive sports, regardless of the disease severity, may promote arrhythmias and may act as a modifiable risk factor in patients that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, thinking that the physiologic stress that's inherent to athletic training and competition may alter your hydration, your blood volume, electrolytes, and the catecholamine surges. However, a recent study that was just published last month looking at, again, children and younger adults aged 10 to 45 years old in Ontario over the past decade who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy found lower rates of sudden cardiac death that occurred at 0.03 to 0.04% per year to remind you, previously it was thought that the rates were 0.3 to 1% per year. So this is lower. And then interestingly, the graph on the right shows what activity was occurring at the time of sudden cardiac death. And as you can see, at 65% of the cohort was at rest or sleeping when the event happened. And 17 to 19%, sorry, 17%. Uh, were undergoing light activity, with only 17% participating in moderate to vigorous exercise. So this notion that vigorous physical exertion increases the risk for sudden cardiac death may not be as clear as we previously had thought. So where does this leave us? I think at the moment in the field of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there remains a level of uncertainty in, about whether sports participation does increase the risk of sudden cardiac death and to what magnitude. 
Um, and I think this really warrants a discussion for how adverse patients and families are to participating in sports and a discussion with your doctor about this. I will say that there's some emerging data coming from several studies. Um, one is called the live HCM study. Um, and this is actually looking at children and young adults who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And they're being asked to wear Fitbits and wear, do their regular activity. And then we're prospectively monitoring what happens to these patients um, as they participate in their normal activities of daily living and normal sports participation. So hopefully in the next one to two years, this will provide some new insight. As I've said before, uh, there's new hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guidelines coming out next year. And then specifically at CHOP, um, at the center that I work at, we're uh, soon to be prospectively enrolling patients that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in a moderate intensity exercise training program to help guide patients on what sort of activity they should be uh, participating in. But at the moment, because we know that restricting sports participation during adolescence puts patients at risk for social isolation, depression, obesity, and loss of post high school educational opportunities, we have to acknowledge that restricting sports participation has not truly been shown to improve survival. Perhaps this is because randomized testing of this hypothesis is not practical and may be considered unethical. So instead, in the current era, there's this model of shared decision making. So when you can talk to your provider about what level of exercise you think makes sense to participate in um, for you, your child. Um, when talking about patients that are inactive, our goal should be trying to get them to be participating in at least light to moderate recreational activity. And then if you're thinking about vigorous activity or highly competitive sports, we acknowledge we need more data. And so discussing this shared decision-making model um, with your provider about the risks and benefits of sports participation um, is really important and should be a dynamic conversation and should be individualized to each family and each child. Um, as there's not one specific guideline that makes sense for everyone. Just as an aside, one other question that will periodically come up in practice is the role of risk or risk of thrill seeking activities such as roller coasters or trampolines. Um, although we do not know specifically in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy what risk those pose. There was a recent study in adults um, that showed that participation in thrill-seeking activities such as these likely has low risk associated with it, but again, should be something you should discuss with your doctor um, based on each, because uh, each individual um, should have an individualized assessment. So in general, for patients with cardiomyopathy, our recommendations for exercise, first and foremost, should involve regular cardiology follow-up with testing, including imaging testing to assess ongoing changes of the heart, evaluating for arrhythmias, and sometimes performing blood work. And this regular follow-up is very important to continue to tailor what exercise recommendations are appropriate uh, in case a child's uh, physiology changes over time. And then additional things, as we talked about before, um, avoiding excess heat and taking breaks as needed is very important. Remaining hydrated while you're exercising. Trying to uh, be very mindful of listening to your body and heeding any warning signs. So feeling like any extra skip beats or lightheadedness or feeling dizzy should absolutely prompt uh, taking a break and seeking medical attention. And then lastly, it's very important for any exercise participation to have an AED on site and for those to be uh, aware of where the AED is, how to use it, and to make sure it's up to 
uh, up to current standards. And sometimes AEDs need to be checked just to make sure the battery is still charged and such. And then one other topic, so when thinking about exercise training and what exercise you should be allowing your child to participate in, one resource that is likely available for you is working with a cardiac exercise physiologist who will be able to provide individualized exercise training recommendations based on your level of heart disease. And so the way this is done is by performing a baseline exercise stress test, as shown in the top right corner, it can be done on a treadmill or a bicycle. And it's a maximal exercise stress test to not only check for abnormal heart rhythms, but also to be able to assess for any symptoms and to identify specific um, levels of exertion or heart rates that you can target when you're doing exercise that remains within a safe threshold. Additionally, based on that information, the exercise physiologist can then provide individualized aerobic and strength training recommendations um, that can either be performed at a cardiac rehabilitation center, as shown below at our center at CHOP, or um, to be performed at home or in a gym or school activity, but so that children feel empowered to know what level of exertion they should be able to push themselves. And then just thinking about what resources are available, obviously the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation is a fantastic resource um, that has a multitude of uh, pieces of information for patients that are think that have cardiomyopathy um, and are potentially struggling with the diagnosis. One other resource I want to point out is uh, a organization called In a Heartbeat. Um, there's a patient or a, uh, the founder of this uh, organization is called Mike Papale, and he had a history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, and had a sudden cardiac event. He was a competitive basketball player on track to be a D1 uh, basketball collegiate player and had a sudden cardiac event. Um, fortunately, he was resuscitated because there was an AED. So he started this organization to try to promote having AEDs available in all schools um, throughout the US. But additionally, he went through um, an experience of trying to cope with having the diagnosis um, after having this sudden cardiac event, having an ICD implanted, and then figuring out how he should continue to be active, but in a way that is safe for him. And so he's uh, made himself available to anyone who's interested in talking about uh, what they're going through, especially if they have a history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, so he's, provi he's kindly provided his uh, email here to be contacted if anyone uh, wants to talk to him more about this. So in summary, I hope you can take away that some degree of exercise is good for everyone, including those with cardiomyopathy. However, some conditions where intense physical activity occurs may be dangerous, and there are efforts underway to evaluate data and publish new guidelines on exercise and sports for those with cardiomyopathy that should be coming soon. It's very important for you to work with your cardiomyopathy team to try to assess what degree of exercise is best. And even within the current guidelines, people with cardiomyopathy can engage in a full variety of activities that can be heart healthy and fulfilling. So with that, um, I thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. I really appreciate um, your time and for um, this 
excellent presentation. Um, I do have a couple of questions that people have submitted. I just want to remind everybody who's listening, if you have a question, um, you can submit it on the question box, um, and I will read out the questions to um, Dr. Bernstein, and she will answer them. So the first question I have is, um, does having an ICD impact the guideline, the guidelines and considerations for an HCM patient? Mm. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so at current state, it does not influence guidelines, whether sports participation is uh, safe or competitive sports participation is safe or not. Um, you know, we do think that it's, it's a nice safety net to have in case there is an event, which is why we do recommend either primary, secondary prevention, ICD placement, but per the current guidelines, whether you have an ICD or not does not change uh, the recommendation for which sports you can participate in. Okay, thank you. Um, so do you have any guidance um, for managing different opinions um, with this shared decision-making model um, regarding teens and their parents who may have very different preferences and level on comfort um, in terms of their participation in an activity? Yeah, this is a, this is a tough question. Um, so I, and it comes up a lot, unfortunately, because of course, children want to be able to participate in sports um, as much as they can, and there's so many benefits to it. Um, I think it's, there's a role for having the doctor be involved, um, your provider to help be a mediator in some of that conversation. So it's not a direct tense conversation between what parents think are appropriate and what children think are appropriate, but mm -hmm. it's important to honor the wishes of what the children want to do um, and try to think about working with children to show them how they can participate in activities that would be considered appropriate or safe. So instead of just focusing on the restrictions and no, you can't do this and you can't do that, working with your provider, be it a physician or an exercise physiologist to try to act, identify activities that can be helpful or can be safe to participate in. Um, the gentleman that I referred to before, Mike Papello, um, went through this exact process. His event happened when he was in high school and there was, he struggled a lot with how to kind of re-identify re himself um, because basketball was his identity. Um, and so talking to other people that have gone through this struggle, I think can be really helpful. And so if you can identify um, others that have gone through this process, I think that's helpful for teenagers to go through, but there's not one great answer, um, but I think trying to shift the mindset of you can't do this, you can't do that towards let's identify activities you can do that will bring you joy. Um, so Mike Papello, after he stopped participating in the high intensity competitive basketball, he still is very physically active and he actually decided to become um, a basketball coach. So he participates in basketball coaching, I think at the high school and college level and has found a lot of fulfillment from that being able to participate at that level. And so just trying to reframe the mindset about what this means for sports participation after getting a diagnosis and acknowledging that there will be some challenge to work through this, but with time, it can get better. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I have another question. You mentioned working with a cardiac, cardiac exercise physiologist. Um, does a patient need to be referred by a physician? And um, um, do you know if it is covered by insurance? Um, so I can primarily speak to my experience here at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, we have a specific exercise physiologist that um, works with our patients um, with heart disease, be it cardiomyopathy or congenital heart disease. And um, it is through a physician referral because we want to make sure we identify 
uh, or we refer our patients to providers that are familiar with cardiomyopathy um, and what sort of rec uh, exercises are recommended. So I would recommend going through your provider to help identify who to speak to. Um, and then at our center, um, it is covered by insurance. So I hope that's true of other centers as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I have one last question. Um, uh, this is um, someone who has a, um, a toddler. Um, so um, is there any reason to limit activity in a toddler? Um, are there particular signs to look for to indicate that um, the child is doing too much? Um, so generally, we don't recommend any sports or physical activity restriction in school-aged children. We really highly recommend just allowing children to self-pace. Um, mm -hmm. Having an event of, such as these sudden cardiac events, um, particularly in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, are highly unheard of in children uh, less than 10 years old. Um, and so there's no reason to be restricting the physical exertion of children, but just encouraging them to self-pace and if they want to take breaks, allowing them and not pushing them beyond what they want to do. So if you're seeing them specifically feeling more winded or um, to the point that they want to take a break, allow them to do so. Some concerning symptoms would be if they appear pale or excessively sweaty beyond what you would expect for other children of um, the same age, or if they pass out or look like they're going to pass out, those are all reasons to seek medical attention. But beyond that, there should not be any restrictions, especially in young children, as far as the physical activity that they want to participate in. Those recommendations I said before regarding making sure they stay hydrated and keeping an extra eye if it's extremely hot outside, you know, the 90 to 100 degree weather and 100% humidity, just being mindful of allowing them to pace themselves and stay hydrated is important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no, no restrictions. Great, great. Um, I think that's it uh, of all the questions that we have. I just, um, if I can take back um, the panel, just, um, oops, let me just do this. Um, and just let everyone remind them that um, the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation can be, um, we have a website where they can get information. Um, today's presentation will be on our YouTube channel. If anybody wants to have the slides today, um, um, they can um, just put a question in the question box and I will get it and I will make sure I send the slides. Um, and with that, I wanna thank um, you, Dr. Bernstein, for presenting this um, excellent webinar today. Uh, we appreciate your time, we appreciate your expertise, and um, for being part of this. It was excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, have a great day. You too. Bye-bye now.